Thank you. Um, well, I could do almost my whole talk today with my introduction slide. Um, it shows you um, two very similar and very different things on two continents. The um, left side is an outcrop in the middle of the Amazon basin of a very extensive clay formation or clay dominant, dominated formation, the Belterra formation. You see a scientist at the bottom there uh, looking at this outcrop and taking samples. Uh, the other side is uh, a continent away. It's a, a habub, a dust storm in, um, in Sudan. And uh, well, you see sort of similar colors on both sides. And so um, uh, consideration of this uh, source of dust on one side of the Atlantic, the known fact that uh, some dust gets transported across, and uh, what looks at least uh, visually similar on the other side led people to the idea that, uh, well, maybe all this dust, um, all, all this clay formation that um, we find on the, in the Amazon is actually the stuff that uh, comes wafted across on the trade winds from Africa. So the hypothesis then that we're examining is maybe the origin of this Belterra clay formation in the Amazon, which is one of the most abundant uh, surface materials, uh, is that actually material that's dust blown from Africa. Uh, I already mentioned it's a sort of a similar appearance. Um, it's, um, dust transport has been observed consistently. Uh, it was observed actually in the middle of the Amazon for the first time in 1985 when uh, we made the first uh, able 2A expedition into the Amazon, that dust is a, is a leading dominant uh, aerosol component uh, during some times of the year. And dust as uh, source materials uh, of soils is known from some Caribbean islands and from Bermuda, so it's not an um, implausible hypothesis to come up with. Uh, but could it maybe also something else, such as uh, detrital material that's been washed down from the Andes, as has been suggested by Wim Sombrook many years ago, or is it maybe just simply this sort of deep weathering of local bedrock? To examine this, uh, we um, went to outcrops on both sides of the continent, uh, took samples, and here you see some of the sampling regions. Uh, uh, one is are these cliffs of, uh, of orange and white materials that one finds along the road that goes north from Manaus in the middle of the Amazon. And, uh, well, the other side is a dust storm now in the Baudelet Depression in the um, country of Chad in Africa. And, uh, well, if you look at the ground, you see most of it is sort of whitish gray material there. And this dust storm, this haboob in there, is actually also uh, whitish gray. But there is also orange stuff around. So at least we have stuff that visually from, uh, from the outside actually looks quite similar. My second point is that, uh, well, this is, um, there is a mechanism. Uh, this is sort of like, you know, um, a, um, a crime case where you say, well, uh, was, there, was there a motive and was there a means? Uh, yes, there is a means, uh, and uh, that is uh, transport from the source regions in Africa, as you see on the right side of your image, where dust is blown out of the Baudelaire Depression, uh, trajectories cross the Atlantic, and then end up uh, at... Uh, I don't know if this moves here, if I should, uh, I think. Mouse moves actually, yes, it moves something, yeah. And they end up in um, Manaus here on the other side. So uh, uh, there definitely is a means. And it's also been shown uh, for single events using spaceborne LIDAR, Calypso, that indeed one can trace a specific plume of dust by slices, laying slices with this LIDAR across the Atlantic from one side to the other. So uh, definitely there is a motive and a means and now we look and see if there is a body, actually. Uh, we do this by taking samples, both on the African side. Uh, here you see the sampling localities that go from the um, Baudelet Basin across uh, and include some samplings that were done uh, on, on Sal Island uh, in the Cape Verde Islands and soil samples uh, that were collected uh, from outcrops in the middle of the Amazon basin. So that's our, uh, our sample population. And now we do chemical analysis. We start with a uh, bulk chemical analysis, just the sort of major elements, and then go on to isotope analysis. Uh, 
the data from the bulk chemical analysis doesn't look particularly promising. Um, if we go through the different sets, we find that um, the Baudelaire samples, the samples of African dust uh, collected in, in Chad and Niger, uh, fall on a, um, a range of compositions that goes from almost no silica, very low silica, <laughs> to rather high silica, uh, but contain very little aluminum oxide. So this is consistent with what we know about these materials on the ground. Uh, they tend to be very diatomite, diatom-rich uh, lake deposits. Um, so the silica-rich components are basically very, uh, almost pure diatomite, uh, di diatomaceous earth sort of material. Uh, if you go on to the next system, uh, titanium dioxide, um, silicon dioxide, we again see that the Belterra materials reach quite high titanium oxide concentrations, but, and are clearly distinct from uh, the, uh, the Belterra materials, which are low in titanium dioxide. And finally, looking at the system, potassium uh, oxide to silicon dioxide, we see that uh, the Belterra materials are totally depleted in, uh, in potassium, whereas the African materials here along this axis show a range of potassium contents consistent with the uh, composition of things like uh, clay minerals such as illite and so on, which are well-known African components of African dust. Well, so you could say, well, yeah, that's nice. Uh, it's different, but why shouldn't it be different? Because the dust that comes across has been lying around near the surface in the Amazon for a long time and has had a chance to undergo deep tropical weathering in this humid environment and the sort of stuff that ends up remaining there in the Belterra, uh, the, um, the aluminum here, uh, the, uh, the, the titanium and so on, are the typical sort of materials that get left behind when material gets intensely weathered. So while this is sort of um, uh, a, an, an indication that uh, these may be different materials, it's definitely not proof. What we want to look for then is uh, geochemical systems that are less subject to perturbation by weathering. The first one that we choose are the rare earth compositions. Rare earth elements uh, tend to be mobilized much less during weathering, and uh, they tend to reflect the, the rocks, basically, from which they originate. When we compare the rare earth patterns from the Baudelaire Depression and from the Belterra, we see that they're altogether different. This is sort of a, a way geochemists plot this as a normalized to, uh, to uh, chondritic crust or meteoric composition, average meteoric composition. Basically, what you want to take away from this is that the pattern is different, that uh, there is one feature that one looks for, this is this europium depletion, is much deeper in the Belterra clay, and that the Belterra clay has a positive anomaly of the rare earth. These are just offset, so they don't overlap each other and cover each other. Um, so it has a positive heavy rare earth anomaly, whereas the Baudelaire just has the opposite, a negative rare earth anomaly. So, Another clue that this stuff seems to be quite different. Now, uh, another nail in the coffin, as it were, of our hypothesis, and, uh, and a very powerful nail, uh, comes from lead isotopes. Uh, lead isotopes uh, originate from some lead that uh, was already present at the formation of, of the Earth, plus some lead isotopes that get pre created by the decay of uranium and thorium, and so uh, each geological terrain, each rock more or less, has its own signature in lead isotope depending on how it originally was formed and how long it sat around and how much uranium and thorium it contained and could produce uh, during its history uh, these radiogenic lead isotopes. Now, when you, and one typically plots, and so this is again sort of geochemist's uh, way of doing things, convention of doing things, these diagrams then in the form of ratios of uh, radiogenic to non-radiogenic lead isotopes and uses the different uh, lead 206, 207, 204 uh, to uh, see patterns and to look for communalities. So again, we see basically a similar story as we've seen in the other uh, element, uh, in the other element, not these isotopes compositions, 
that um, the Belterra materials, and this is a combination of two samplings, so that's why you have green and red dots, uh, fall along a beautiful trend, uh, which goes from a very highly radiogenic, something that, uh, uh, oh, I hate this mouse, um, something that, uh, that sits out here and has accumulated a lot of uh, lead isotopes, uh, 207 and 206 from radioactive decay, um, so it's either quite old or it contains a lot of the precursors, uh, and then falls along a linear trend connecting it to the other sort of end member of the, of, of the Belterra materials, but in no way do they even overlap one another. Now, one can make an argument, they don't really need to overlap even. Um, it would be nice if they did, but they don't need to overlap in order to have at least partially the same origin. One could argue that indeed uh, there is a, uh, an African end member, and this is where all the African stuff plots, uh, both the soil, the ground samples from the Baudelaire, the dust deposits that were collected sort of from inside abandoned buildings, uh, sediments uh, off of Cape Verde, so all the African dust ends up sitting here. Uh, and this, in one way, could maybe be a mixing end member of a series that goes from this material mixing with uh, the uh, material of Brazilian origin. Uh, on this diagram, that's possible. If you look at another diagram, we see that, uh, which also shows different lead isotopes, I'm not showing this here to not confuse you, that this intersection point, which would be the sort of end member of this mixing series, is different for the two different isotope systems. So there can't even be a uh, sort of a common end member that mixes in with this material. So from this, and from the next isotope system, the uh, neodymium isotopes, uh, we can firmly conclude that there is no detectable contribution of African dust within the Baudelaire material. Um, the, isot the epsilon neodymium, so that's the neodymium isotope composition plotted against the lead isotope composition, clusters the Baudelaire, the African, all the African materials in this set here, uh, one can get sort of a, an, an, an idea, let's say, of the age of this material, which is sort of, uh, well, neoproterozoic, uh, about uh, one billion sort of order of magnitude years old. Uh, so the Baudelaire is newer material, whereas the Belterra reflects more ancient material from Archean, uh, three million, billion years ago or so, um, to, uh, to middle proterozoic or something like that. So it's also material of quite different ages. And this already then leads us uh, to the next question now, if it doesn't come from Africa, where then does it come from? And we've plotted here already um, the locations in this, uh, in this space of, some of the rivers that drain the Andes and a river that drains the, the Brazilian shield, the Trombetas River, and another one that also drains part of the Brazilian shield. And you see that uh, the African stuff and the Andes sort of come together, but the Belterra is on a quite different trend, and I'll come back to that in a second. So, but first let me say that uh, indeed the African dust cannot be the source of the Belterra because the major elements disagree, the rare earth patterns disagree, all isotope patterns disagree. Uh, so then, as I say, where does it come from? Well, we've eliminated the African dust, so left over are the detrital materials from the Andes and weathering of regional bedrock. Uh, well, uh, looking again at our isotope system, this time we use the, the lead lead system, we see that uh, the Andes rivers all plot essentially in the same region of this diagram as the African materials, whereas the Belterra does not, and only the Bel Trombetas River, a river of the uh, sort of northeastern Amazon basin, plots there, which shows that the hypothesis that the Belterra comes from the Andes also is clearly falsified. So what remains is, and actually that's quite plausible uh, with the uh, geological outcrop behavior of much of this material, what remains is weathering of regional bedrock where everything sort of fits. Um, this is close to the end of my talk, and there's another completely interesting development that one could go on to now for yet another talk, and that is uh, where actually does the dust material in Africa come from uh, that we see being transported out? 
And here again, we can use the same isotope systems, and I'm showing you here you <coughs> the strontium uh, isotope, uh, plot, the plot of the neodymium versus the strontium isotopes. And you see that here, again, we're separating the Belterra out, but then if we ignore that, we get actually a quite, right, a quite rich uh, amount of information on the isotopic composition of the materials from Africa. And this is work that is ongoing where we're now trying to actually establish a database on uh, the isotopic composition of African rocks and match that to the isotopic composition of uh, dusts that we collect in various places in, off, in Africa and off of Africa and in the Caribbean region. Thank you. So we have time for one or two questions. We didn't uh, do any size-separated uh, analysis yet on the, on the dusts. Um, there is uh, obviously uh, size selection. Um, part of it is it's quite difficult to actually get enough material for these isotopic analyses. So um, we ended up uh, using bulk samples um, and this with the assumption that indeed uh, they would capture the bulk of the dust material. Uh, with the lead, you have to t uh, take some extra care because, in fact, uh, there is, of course, a considerable amount of anthropogenic lead uh, that's being transported around, which tends to be enriched on the fine fraction. What we've done um, to sort these out, we're actually doing leaching with uh, materials of uh, acids or, 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 or buffers um, of different aggressiveness to remove the anthropogenic lead and leave behind the rock lead um, so that we can separate these apart from one another. Um, it's, um, it will be, we're interested in developing uh, more, um, uh, better size classification sampling methods, but uh, for the moment we were just quite happy to get enough material collected together. And basically if you go into a place like, uh, like Cape Verde, of course, um, that dust mode is so dominant, uh, it really uh, uh, overpowers all other materials. Any other questions? If not, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Um, we would like to now introduce you to our next speaker of today, which is uh, Paul Demott from Colorado State University in Fort Collins. All right, thank you. Uh, this uh, image here from our project uh, about a year ago in the summertime is sort of the uh, end product motivation of the research I'm going to talk about today. Um, and the, uh, the goal is to say whether we're dealing with a pristine marine boundary layer that's feeding the cloud systems or ones that are impacted by African dust, is there a difference in the evolution of the cloud microphysics and precipitation? Okay, so um, what the uh, goal that I'm going to talk about today is um, tr how well do we understand the behavior of African and other types of mineral dust particles as ice nuclei in the atmosphere on the basis of both laboratory studies and measurements um, in, in, uh, in the atmosphere around clouds. Um, I'm going to show you that there is some consistency between uh, the laboratory measurements um, and field campaign data suggesting that we can use relatively simplified parameterizations to predict the ice formation and then compare that to what actually happens in clouds. I'm not going to get to that final step today. I'm going to focus actually just on the measurements. So we had this project called the Ice and Clouds Tropical Clouds Experiment in the Caribbean based out of St. Croix in the summer of 2011. Um, and this just shows the various flights. The uh, C-130 aircraft was, was heavily instrumented with aerosol and cloud 
probes and in, in the interior, we were measuring single particle compositions and so forth and CCN and ice nuclei um, activity with different me measurement systems. Also at the same time that was the Puerto Rican African Dust and Cloud Study uh, that Olga was helping to lead in, in Puerto Rico and we also collected measurements at two sites, uh, one on a mountaintop and one near the, the seashore there and I'll mention a few of those. Um, so the uh, measurement methods that we used were uh, an assortment of both online and offline methods. The um, online method is the one that I use primarily. Um, it, it, to, to describe it basically, you take a, uh, an assortment of uh, aerosol particles, whether they're insoluble or soluble, uh, of all sizes, we remove the very largest particles because they would, uh, uh, it would make it difficult to distinguish grown ice crystals from the very large aerosol. So the cut is about two and a half microns. We then um, introduce the particles, focus them through a supersaturation field in an instrument uh, where they both droplets and uh, droplets grow and ice crystals can nucleate it at lower temperatures. We remove the uh, droplets in the lower section by having the temperatures of the diffusion chamber be approximately the same on both sides of the walls, and then we're left with the ice crystals that we can count and impact to look at uh, the compositions of the particles that are left over. We sample both from uh, ambient forward-facing inlets on the aircraft and from counterflow virtual impactor inlet that is extracting the uh, cloud particles and we're looking at the residuals and processing them. The, the sample uh, volume is, is rather small, it's only a liter and a half a minute, so we have to integrate those samples over long times to get to the relatively low numbers of ice nuclei that we sometimes measure. So we introduced some other methods for the ICE-T study. Uh, the, the one at the top here are instruments based in Germany and in Israel uh, where they collect the particles onto silicon wafers and, and those are then processed in the diffusion chamber for ice nucleation activity or the um, particles can be washed from filters and put as very small droplets on the same surface and then it's cooled and they look for the uh, activity of the ice nuclei. I'm not going to show results from this one today because in fact in the ice tea experiment um, there was a positive artifact identified associated with uh, sea salt particles, so that's still being evaluated. I'm going to show you results from the filter measurements. Where we, this allowed us to collect very large volumes of air, hundreds, thousands of uh, liters of air. The particles were uh, rinsed with, with ultra-pure water and then put into sort of 30 to 50 microliter wells, uh, an array of 96 uh, at one time, and then these are cooled in steps. And when, it allows us to get at the very low numbers of ice nuclei at modest supercoolings below zero. So uh, just to uh, take this back a little bit, the very first measurements we ever made on aircraft uh, uh, through an African aerosol layer was back in the crystal face experiment in 2003, uh, a series of papers uh, uh, with Ken Sasson. And he was using his uh, LIDAR on the ground in Florida, and you can see the uh, uh, dust layer here in these, these sort of yellowish-orange colors. Uh, and in the same location as we passed through the layer, we measured elevated hundreds to nearly a thousand per liter ice nuclei um, in, in association with very large aerosol particles and um, a stronger depolarization indicating the dust aerosols. These are clouds up here. At the same time, a cloud passed over his uh, LIDAR and, and he saw that this cloud with a top of only about minus nine degrees was glaciating, looking very much like a cirrus cloud almost. We were processing ice nuclei at minus 37 though, so relating these and saying, oh, that was the dust activating became a little bit more difficult. So part of the goal of ICE-T was to stretch out the uh, evaluation region of temperatures. Okay, so here are some vertical profiles from the ICE-T exper uh, experiments, uh, uh, 13 different flights. Um, we uh, didn't get extremely lucky with dust in July of 2011. And most of it, a lot of it came early in the uh, project. This is uh, the two main um, flights I'm going to show some data from are this, uh, the 4th of July and the 15th of July where you see elevations and these are the particle concentrations above about a half a micron from the FSSP 300 probe um, <clears throat> showing elevations of the numbers above uh, the marine boundary layer here at about say about a thousand meters is the top of that. And, um, and an RF2, here's some LIDAR data again showing that dust layer between about two and four kilometers. The, the, the LIDAR in this case is on the aircraft. And the dry layer on the, set, the 4th of July is also, it shows you the same location of that dust layer as opposed to a day without dust, uh, which is toward the end of the project here. 
So here's a compendium of the ice nuclei data from the continuous flow chamber during the project put together by Gavin McMeeking and our group. Uh, the blue points are indicating ones where we have, because the numbers were sufficient, the statistics were good enough, we could have very high confidence in, in saying what the ice nuclei concentrations were. The red points are still valid. It's just that the uh, confidence, the uncertainties are much larger. What it shows is um, a, a decrease in the ice nuclei concentrations as you head toward warmer temperatures. Now, a lot of the ice formation in these clouds starts as warm as, as minus 6, minus 8 degrees, and so that's what we're trying to get at. What are the number concentrations there? But from these data, the highest values did occur during dust uh, events, and they're on the order of a few per liter at minus 15, and maybe a few tenths per liter at, at minus 10. Um, Gavin also compared the data to a parameterization that I published in 2000. 10 in PNAS. This was sort of a global ice nuclei parameterization based on um, uh, uh, nine or ten different projects where we made measurements in the atmosphere, and the, the uh, one to one line between predicted and observed ice is from that study, and about 63 percent of the measurements fit within the uh, dashed lines there. So what this is showing is that um, we are getting more ice nuclei in the dust layers compared to that sort of average ice nuclei in the atmosphere situation. Uh, m many more by up to four or five times. And <clears throat> this was most of the cases where we had significant, um, we could ascribe significance to the, to the data. Okay, so then I went back to uh, laboratory studies we did as far back as 2007 at the um, AIDA facility in Karlsruhe in Germany and said, well, is this consistent with what we understand from uh, dust. So, in other words, you can't treat it as, you have to treat it as a special source of ice nuclei, as maybe we have to treat all particles out there for global models. Um, so, these show the data um, of ice nuclei number concentrations versus aerosol concentrations above a half a micron again. And it's, it's uh, broken out by different temperature regimes and five degree regimes from minus 20 to about minus 35. And you see that the data for each temperature fall along consistent relationships. And this is both for a laboratory data, and this being Saharan dust are the ones here, and then an Asian dust sample from uh, China here. On the same plot, I stuck some of the aircraft data from the ICE-T experiment, and they match up quite well with the same relationships of just uh, Saharan dust. Um, and data from the PACDEX experiment um, um, from Japan and over the Pacific region that falls in line as well. And so it's interesting that even though we have dust of very different mineralogy and so forth, that we have relatively um, consistent, simple relationships that fall out. Something is governing of similarity in the ice nucleation activity of these different um, dusts. And then again over here on the right, I'm comparing the dust data. This is at minus 25 from the laboratory and from the field data. Um, uh, versus the parameterization of sort of this global ion and showing, again, these are much more enhanced than their ice nucleation activity. Um, just as a prelude, Otmar is probably, Mueller is going to talk about this later. Um, some of the same data from the cloud uh, studies in, in Germany um, can be, you can create a parameterization as a function of the surface site density of the ion and again shows this fall off with temperature toward, toward warmer temperatures, fewer and fewer of the uh, particles or ice nucleation active. I'm going to compare these two parameterizations, so I wanted to just mention that one. Okay, so here's a, a vertical profile through the uh, a dust layer on the 4th of July in the ICE-T experiment. Again, these are the uh, aerosol concentration data above a half a micron. I'm showing you where about the top of the marine boundary layer is. Uh, the blue um, is the ice nuclei measurements from the continuous flow chamber. This is where that instrument kind of shines. When you have a strong signal, you can pick it up in, in, in very high resolution. So. <clears throat> um, the, uh, there's, a, there's a gap in the data here, and what happened there was um, I decided to remove the ice crystal impactor at the bottom to, because we were going to be going up and down through this dust layer, or so we, we thought, so there's a gap, and, and as it turned out, we ended up having to go land at the uh, bottom of this one, so we didn't get to see much more about this layer. But what I wanted to show is for that parameterization of the dust based on the laboratory studies, that's the D one here, it's comparing the parameterization created just from the CFDC data to the data we collected in the cloud, and it does quite well up in the, in the dust layer, but then it's far over-predicting what we saw once we got down into the marine boundary layer. 
And so I show some other things here. This is the uh, global parameterization from the PNAS paper. Again, when we're in dust, that's overdoing it. When we're in the marine boundary layer, uh, it's, under, it's not predicting high enough. But when we're in marine boundary layer, it's actually higher than that. So we've had the opportunity to do some measurements of sea spray aerosols recently um, at Scripps. And um, I'm going to show up, uh, my last slide on that. But this is sort of the results you, we expect on parameterizing those data. So much, much lower IN number concentrations from the sort of pristine marine boundary layer than you get when you have dust around. The other curves are from the Niemann et al. Pr uh, parameterization of surface area, surface area parameterization. And uh, I'm not going to describe the CD one. That, that, that takes some, some time. But uh, that, that the understanding there is that we actually have some consistency between this other parameterization and the Niemann et al. when we consider all factors. OK, so here's um, the next flight, the RF6 flight. And the only time we were solidly within the dust layer are the data points when we're processing at a relatively low temperature, minus 27. We also were, uh, I have some data from the CVI inlet when we were within the marine boundary layer in clouds. And I have um, results from the filter measurements based in Puerto Rico at the uh, Cape San Juan site and the PE site is at about 1,100 meters. They are fairly consistent, both mostly within the marine boundary layer that day. Um, much lower ice nuclei concentrations, in fact, very low. This would be one per cubic meter right here. Um, and the other thing that we're showing in those measurements is we, we were able to reprocess those samples. We heated them to 95 C for 20 minutes with the intent of destroying any bacterial ice nuclei. And in fact, it shows that bacterial ice nuclei were not extremely important at these warmer temperatures um, in this case. Uh, that doesn't say whether they're organic or inorganic ice nuclei yet. The dust parameterization is here that we got from the CFDC data. It lines up uh, so, more or less. It's a little under predicting what we saw in the dust layer. But I extrapolated it for the same aerosol concentrations to show you where that would go. And now I'm going to put up the Niemann et al. parameterization. Again, it, it, over, it predicts um, higher than the one that we put together from the CFDC data. But here it is for this flight here. But I decided to take the uh, maximum dust concentrations we saw within the African dust layers during iced tea and put an upper bound on where that would predict as a function of temperature so that you're able to see that at minus 15, as we saw in our data, um, the maximum numbers are some few per liter. At minus 10, we're talking about a few tenths of ice nuclei per liter. And you could take this warmer if you like, but we need more data in that region. Well, we have some data, at least for not for dust affected layers in that region, where I'm doing a little bit of an aside here to talk about the ice nuclei when we were within the marine boundary layer. Um, and all the blue data points are from the ice tea project, whether we were on the aircraft or collecting on the ground and filters in, in Puerto Rico. All the red data are from this um, study um, at, at Scripps with Kim Prather and, and a number of other people. And those are where we're generating realistic sea spray from breaking waves. And so the da those data are consistent with the ice tea for these sort of oceanic marine boundary layer aerosols. And they are consistent with a range of studies made over uh, oceanic regions. I'll just let you read those. But those are the uh, sort of arrows and the dashed line here. So what it says is we, had, we collected this sample in Puerto Rico for um, nearly three days just to get a sufficient numbers of particles that we could assess the ice nuclei concentrations in this marine boundary layer air. And they are very low. And in fact, at these temperatures, they're um, it's still one to two orders of magnitude lower than we get when we do have a dust incursion. So it's suggesting that the dust would have an impact even at these warm temperatures. OK, so to summarize, um, presently, if I had to put an upper bound on the ice nucleation activity of African dust that transits to the, Puerto, uh, to the uh, Caribbean region, it'd be a few per liter at minus 15 in these dust layers being ingested into clouds, uh, perhaps a few tenths per liter at minus 10. Uh, these um, perturbed layers, uh, the ion concentrations exceed those coming from uh, sea spray aerosols, I believe, by one to two orders of magnitude, even in this relatively warm temperature regime. And we need, but we need stronger direct evidence of that uh, via improving our methods, getting better statistics on the ice nuclei concentration, and going to regions where we get even stronger gradients, for example, right off of Africa. And that's a project called ICE-D that we're going to propose for 2015. Um, uh, modeling studies and, and including other observations from the clouds would be needed to understand the sort of how, how these um, uh, dust particles then interact in the clouds to affect um, the cloud droplet processes and the interaction between the warm and cold phases 
and pri uh, primary and secondary ice generation processes in order to predict the impacts on precipitation, and that would be a different talk from today. So I'm going to stop there and show my acknowledgments to acknowledge primary support from the uh, U.S. National Science Foundation, also the DOE Office of Science for some of the parameterization work. I want to thank Kim Prather and the Center for Aerosol Impacts on Chemistry and the Environment for the sea spray measurements, uh, Cindy Tui and Darren Tui for the CVI data, Zhen Wang for the radar and LIDAR data, uh, Miralise uh, Martin, uh, Diaz Martinez for some of the filter measurements, and um, uh, which were done under the guidance of Tom Hill and uh, my late very good friend uh, Gary Franz. Thank you. So, thank you very much, Paul. We have time for one or two questions. Cindy. It was carried over. I, I don't know. I don't know what concentrations are present in the in layers off of Africa, but maybe you can tell me here <laughs> shortly. Um, but uh, these were like like you saw uh, somewhere between uh, 20 and 80 per cubic centimeter at sizes above a half a micron. I don't know. I can't convert that to into into mass loadings for you. Um, but I suspect that it's it's uh, that they're lower concentrations than you would have right off of Africa. Yeah, so I didn't uh, mention that the way we process the aerosol particles for the measurements was to uh, expose them to water vapor supersaturation. So they were actually activated as CCN and then uh, frozen, whether they, were, whether they had sulfates on them or not. Um, that remains to be investigated, whether that impacts their their activity or not. Some species might, but it, our, in our previous studies, it seems that uh, whatever is on them, it would have to be reactive to affect their ice nucleation activity. Once we activate them as CCN and we dilute away solutes, um, it seems not to have a great impact on the ice nucleation activity. So we will like now to introduce our next speaker. Um, Dr. Joseph M. Prospero from the University of Miami, Florida, with his talk, um, uh, where is it? Trends in African Dust Transport to the Caribbean, African Sources, Changing Climate, and Future Scenarios. Uh, good morning. <clears throat> Uh, <clears throat> uh, we all know that uh, dust uh, aerosols can affect climate through a variety of processes, uh, but dust is of uh, particular interest because climate can itself uh, modify the amount of dust in the atmosphere. So in order to understand future uh, trends in uh, aerosol uh, climate interactions, we have to have a better understanding of the factors that affect uh, dust generation and uh, uh, be able to predict the, the conditions that we might expect that would lead to increased or decreased uh, dust mobilization. The primary focus of this presentation is our aerosol data from Barbados, which starts in 1965, and it, uh, it's continuing at present, and I'll show data in 2011. And to my knowledge, this is the longest uh, uh, aerosol record in existence, and I'm going to discuss the relationship between the dust transport and variability in terms of uh, sources and transport conditions and changes in the recent decades. Uh, this is Barbados. Uh, do we have a pointer here? And there's the coast of Africa, and it's 5,000 kilometers. The dust sources are 1,000 kilometers or so further uh, inland. Uh, our s station is located in on the east coast of Barbados, and I, I can't get this to... There we go. Uh, there, we're located on the promontory, 30 meters elevation, 17 meter tower, some laboratories. And uh, give you an idea of the variability, these are daily uh, dust 
concentrations in two years, uh, 1998, which was a relatively high dust year in the recent record, and 2008, which is a relatively low dust year. And you can see the tremendous spikiness uh, across the records, much higher concentrations in 1998 compared to 2008. But the major and major difference here is a great deal more activity in the winter and spring and even in the fall in 98 compared with uh, 2008. And uh, there's an issue of, of health, which I'll only mention briefly here, that when you see concentrations of this order, about half of the, half of the dust mass is PM2.5, so the, that uh, those spikes uh, could uh, be a health issue. Um, this is the long-term record expressed in monthly mean dust concentrations. In the inset, you have the uh, average dust concentration to, in, per month for the entire record. You see the maximum is in June. You should, Paul, you should have gone in June rather than July. Uh, but uh, the, uh, you see this uh, tremendous variability here with the peaks in the summer months. Uh, note also there's a lot of variability in the winter months across the record. and. Uh, as we will see, these uh, sharp increase in the early 70s and again in the early 80s coincided with drought in Africa. Uh, the seasonal variability is located is associated with the seasonal variability of dust activity in Africa itself and the changes in large-scale circulation. In the summer months, uh, Barbados and the Caribbean lies in the plume of Africa. Uh, in the spring, which is also extremely active, uh, the dust tends to be carried a bit to the south, but depending on the vagaries of the, uh, and the shifts of the circulation from day to day, you can get to substantial amounts in the Caribbean as well on the time, time, on, from time to time, which you saw in 1998 was particularly dramatic, and still we see it today. Uh, this is the, these are the annual mean dust concentrations, concentrations microgram per cubic meter of air, and uh, for the entire record, and as I mentioned before, this is the first drought, this is the second drought. Subsequent to the mid-1980s, uh, dust concentrations remain at a relatively high level. They're variable. Uh, some years, the dust concentrations are as high as they were in the peak of the drought. So it's, it's a very dynamic situation. And now we're going to compare with rainfall. Uh, what I have plotted here is the uh, Sahel precipitation anomalies. The red line is Sahel precipitation anomalies on this scale. It's the arithmetic negative of the anomalies, so the, the, the most arid years are shown at the top of the scale. And it's, there's a clear uh, uh, correspondence between the big peaks in the early 70s and then again the second drought in the early 80s with the dust concentrations. What happened subsequent to the 80s, though, it's, a, it's, it's highly variable. The, uh, the Sahel precipitation anomalies are from the uh, University of Washington Dusau website, and that's the Sahel for those of you who don't know where the Sahel is. And now I want to look at the relationship of dust to rainfall. This is the figure that I just got done showing to you. And this is a scatter plot of the annual mean dust concentration uh, from 1965 to 1986 against the previous year Sahel precipitation anomaly. And that clearly is a very nice relationship. If we do the entire record, we get this scatter plot, not nearly as neat, but it says, hey, it looks somewhat the same. But that's purely fictitious because if we look at the data since the mid-1980s, you get this relationship. And that slope that you see there is largely driven by three years. That's 87, 98, and 2001. And if you take that out, what you get is essentially, over the past 25 years, no relationship between the dust concentrations we see in Barbados, no, no obvious relationship between the dust concentrations that we see in Barbados and, uh, and uh, rainfall in Africa, which, as you will note, is still somewhat, in general, below the long-term mean. Um, there's a lot of literature on what's driving the droughts in Africa and, <clears throat> and, uh, and also the relationship of those drivers to dust, and I'm not going to go through them, but I'm just going to mention one thing that stands out, and that's the Atlantic multidecadal oscillation. And what I have here is a plot of the three-year moving average of the Barbados dust concentrations in red, and I have the AMO plotted in green, and the AMO scale is here, and the purple is, are the Sahel precipitation anomalies. So the 
The drought and the big dust and the peaks and dust are clearly associated with these huge negative AOMO periods, but subsequent to the mid 80s, there's no, no clear relationship that stands out. There are a number of papers, as I said, that look into this in greater detail, and there are some suggestive things, but uh, I won't go into that. Uh, there's talk now of the greening of the Sahel. And uh, this is a recent paper. There are a number of papers. This is a particularly extensive one by Herman et al. This figure shows the, the greening, so-called greening band across Africa. And uh, so the, the question is, if you know, we have continuing low rainfall across this region, but there is greening that's going on. Uh, there are patches where that are not so great. There's a great deal of rainfall variability, as you might expect. Uh, but the, the question is, the, uh, you know, is there any relationship uh, uh, between this supposed greening and our uh, dust concentrations? And in the adjacent figure, uh, I show a figure from uh, Fomenti et al., where, among other things, they summarize seven papers which attempt to map out the general areas of intense dust activity. And those, that's what you, you see, those summaries of those seven different papers there. And I draw all these lines here to demark the boundaries that you see in the greening area. And this is where I sort of stopped the comparison there. But you can see this greening is taking place just on the southern edge of the most intense uh, dust uh, areas. Uh, that uh, the most active dust areas. I do the, the, there's a great deal of interest in land use and the impact on dust mobilization. Uh, the PBS program on the Dust Bowl has uh, stimulated some of that interest. But uh, what we're looking at is the possibility of sort of a dust bowl within a, a huge natural dust bowl. Uh, and what I show here is population growth in the Sahel region. Uh, this is a paper that uh, maps out the, marks out the population growth uh, of 130 cities throughout this region. And note the scale, these are, this is the percent growth per year over the 80s and 90s. Some of these are absolutely huge and difficult to believe. But again, I demark those, those areas that you saw as the greening and also uh, show the relationship to the most active dust source area. So most of this growth is in this marginal area in the Sahel, which are not our normal high dust areas. Uh, there's, uh, a, 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 as I said, a lot of interest in uh, land use impacts. Uh, Paul Chenu is presenting a paper on uh, Thursday in, the, in, a, in which he uses the modus deep blue, a uh, high resolution tenth of a degree, to identify dust sources, and he shows that dust Many of the dust sources are associated with uh, agriculture and, uh, and also ephemeral water bodies. They're, they're linked also to the presence of ephemeral water bodies. The water, water agriculture, and dust go together in a large part of the world. Uh, a lot of interest in dust models, and I'm not going to say much about it other than there are still problems with dust models. There was a review paper by Huneas et al. where they looked at 15 dust models as part of the AeroCom project, and among other things rel relevant to our discussion here, the Caribbean Barbados, uh, the dust models had a problem reproducing the Barbados dust record. This is one year, 2002. And they also, they had difficulty in uh, 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 generating the seasonal shift in the aerosol optical thickness over the tropical Atlantic. And finally, I want to wrap up with uh, addressing the issue of prospective long-term changes that might impact dust mobilization. Uh, the IPCC, the recent IPCC effort 2012 uh, came out with this publication recently uh, talking about the uh, extreme events and they present a number of things including uh, future fo forecasts of soil moisture which is the figure on the right and what I've done is extract uh, one of those uh, part of that figure for North Africa, this is for uh, 46, uh, 2046 to 2065. And the usual procedure here is they color code those, uh, uh, those cells where the models, two thirds of the models agree that, uh, that uh, in this case, soil moisture would increase or decrease. You can see the scale down here. The gray areas are where the models are evenly split. So this triangular area is brings your eye to the most active dust source region, Africa. 
So what this says is that the models uh, cannot agree on whether this region, which is presently the most active dust source region, uh, will be drier or wetter in the 2046 to 2065. So there's, that's one aspect of the problem. The other aspect is wind velocities. They have a wind velocity forecast, and again, I extract the figure. Um, this is uh, December, January, February, and, uh, uh, and June, July, August. You see the, Jan uh, the uh, December, January, February forecast. There's no agreement as to what's going to happen in this region of the most active dust source areas. But the uh, June, July, August uh, forecast, uh, there is uniform agreement, pretty good agreement, that the wind velocities will increase 10% or more in this region. And this, as I said, is the most active dust source today in the summer months. We can expect in the future then, if this forecast is correct, and I might remind you this is 2081. I'll report on the results in the year 2101 at the fall meeting, if you're interested. Uh, but, uh, but so there, there, there are a number of problems then, and to wrap it up, uh, I will just go to the bottom line is that there, we, have, there, you know, we don't really understand what's going on today with dust mobilization and transport, and the forecasts for the climate over those regions, which we know are the most active dust sources, are not very conclusive. So as a result, really, it's impossible to predict uh, what's going to happen with dust transport in the coming decades. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, we have time for some questions. Are, are you? Uh, I couldn't quite get all your question. Is it? Yes, the greening, yes. Well, okay. Uh, no, I, I, uh, the, my, my comment was that that's the area of greening, and that greening was measured over, that's the normalized difference uh, vegetation index. Uh, excuse me, the light is shining right in my eyes. Uh, and that is sort of the, the trend over the, the period 1982 to the 2005, I forget what it was in the paper. Um, and so my point is that we're continuing to see relatively high levels of dust transport. Although I might add in the last eight, ten years, there is indication that uh, the transport, the concentrations are decreasing. I showed you that one uh, year, 2008, is being extremely low. So there may be something going on, but it's difficult to pick out a trend at this time. But there's a lot of stuff going on there. I guess that my, my summarizing comment is there are a lot of different things pulling in different directions as to mobilization. And the land use fund could be offsetting any greening. In fact, if increased rain, you might expect increased agriculture. Uh, Paul's paper may address some of those issues on Thursday. So our next speaker is uh, Ronald Miller from NASA GIAS in, in New York, and the title of his talk is The Comparative Influence of Aerosol Radiative Forcing at the Surface and Top of Atmosphere Upon the Hydrologic Cycle. First of all, I'd like to thank my co-authors, uh, Peter Knieperts, uh, Carlos Perez, Jan Perlwitz, Ina Tegan, and, um, uh, and Peng Zhan. And uh, what I'd like to do is uh, talk about it, uh, something that's really complementary to Paul's talk. Uh, so Paul, for example, talked about microphysical effects of dust on precipitation. What I'd like to do is look at the radiative budget uh, and uh, see how dust radiative forcing uh, influences precipitation. Okay, so in some ways this is kind of a synthesis talk. I've tried to uh, make sense of some uh, several 
uh, ideas in, in, the, uh, in the literature, um, try to reconcile some, some contradic uh, contradictions. Uh, one idea that seems uh, fairly prominent is the idea that if you have uh, uh, a dimmer surface because you have an aerosol layer, that uh, the evaporation will be reduced and therefore for, uh, precipitation will be reduced. So the idea is that if you have surface dimming, that uh, you'll have a reduced hydrologic cycle. And this seems like a fairly robust result. Uh, essentially, uh, you can look at the surface energy balance and you can see that the uh, dust radiative forcing uh, at the surface has to be balanced by anomalous fluxes. And it seems reasonable to assume uh, that you can have a reduction in evaporation um, that will lead to a reduction in precipitation. There's another idea, which is basically that the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the dust layer acts as an elevated heat source. The difference in enforcing between the top and the bottom of the dust layer uh, is a heat source in general, especially for the more absorbing dust particles, uh, the particles that absorb shortwave, uh, shortwave radiation. Um, and the idea is that you have to balance this heating by ascent, which uh, can in many circumstances lead to precipitation. So I basically want to re-examine these. Um, I'm going to conclude at the end that actually both of these ways of looking at it, are, looking at the problem, are really too, too simplistic and that we need, we need more nuance. And so I'll try to explain why I think that. Um, the bottom panels uh, are essentially, first of all, on the, um, uh, on the left side, uh, that shows the surface radiative forcing according to one dust model. Uh, it's not very important which model I used or how realistic it is. Uh, the general features are the same in most of the models. Uh, you see a dust cloud that extends out from Africa and the Middle East. Uh, there's a reduction in radiation at the surface. The surface is dimmer, the sun is dimmer underneath the dust cloud. Uh, that's a fairly robust prediction of these models. Um, on, the, uh, um, on the right side uh, is a panel showing the change in rainfall. Uh, in the model uh, that results from the, uh, for, from the dust radiative forcing. And you can see that uh, one of the most actually robust features is this reduction in rainfall downwind of the African sources over the West Atlantic. Um, again, kind of a naive uh, uh, explanation for that is you have this dust, uh, this dust layer, it's reducing evaporation and therefore uh, uh, moisture flowing into the ITCZ. There's one more feature actually which is, which is I think interesting, which is uh, it shows that uh, there's actually a, an increase in rainfall by dust over the, uh, the Sahel uh, in Western Africa. And uh, that's something I want to uh, wanna try to talk about. Okay, so before I, uh, before I talk about regional changes, I just want to look at the scaling of, uh, of rainfall, uh, the rainfall anomaly with the forcing uh, according, to a, uh, according to a model. And I've actually seen this uh, result in a couple of models. So I think it's fairly robust. Uh, we did three separate experiments. In one experiment, uh, we used uh, what we thought was our best estimate, our most realistic estimate of uh, the dust radiative parameters. So uh, we used essentially measurements of uh, short, short wave absorption and, uh, and uh, used those to specify the dust radiative forcing. We did two more perturbation experiments, one where we made the particles more reflecting and uh, one where we, where we made them more absorbing. And you can see uh, as far as the, um, let's do this. actually I really can't see it all from here. But basically the, uh, the leftmost column uh, shows the, uh, uh, the top of the atmosphere forcing. Oh, okay, so we do this. Nope, can't do that either, okay. Um, the leftmost column shows the top of the atmosphere forcing, and you can see the effect of making the particles more absorbing is that they, the, force, the top of the atmosphere forcing goes from negative to positive. Uh, the effect of making the, the particles more absorbing on the surface forcing is to, is to, is to increase uh, the forcing, to, base, to basically make the, uh, uh, the surface dimmer. So as we make the particles more absorbing, the dust layer is not only reflecting radiation back out to space, it's also absorbing it, and both of these combine to result in a dimmer surface. Now, uh, what's surprising, at least initially, is if you look at the far right column and it shows you the, uh, the, the global annual average evaporative anomaly of millimeters per day, the key point is while well, you always see a reduction as you make the particles uh, darker, more absorbing, and the surface dimmer, in fact, the evaporation and the rainfall, instead of, uh, instead of further decreasing, instead of uh, further drying out the circulation, actually, uh, you, you see the opposite trend. Uh, the rainfall anomaly actually um, becomes, uh, be, sorry, uh, be, becomes less negative. All right, and uh, that's, that's somewhat surprising again. You know, you would expect that as the surface becomes dimmer that somehow evaporation actually decreases to compensate that, but that's not happening. So the, uh, the hypothesis we have is that essentially uh, what's really happening here, what's really controlling the variations of evaporation and rainfall 
uh, has to do with the, the top of the atmosphere forcing. And I'm going to try to, uh, to talk about that. Uh, just before I do that, I want to show one more plot. This is from a uh, paper that Jan Perlwitz uh, wrote in 2010. And there are two plots here. Essentially, it, it looks at the, uh, the compensation between surface radiative forcing um, and the evaporative anomaly uh, over, the, uh, uh, over the, the land, which I think is, uh, yeah, to, is to the left and, sorry, is, is, is to your right, and the, uh, uh, no, I'm sorry, <laughs> to your left, and then the ocean, which is, which is, to, the, uh, uh, which, which is to the right. Um, you can see that over the ocean, we get essentially the expected relation. Um, we, we get the relation we, we would expect between evaporation and surface forcing. You have a, a dimmer surface and there's less evaporation over the ocean. And so um, that's indicated uh, kind of qualitatively by the yellow line. Uh, if you look over land, however, you see just the opposite, uh, you just, you, you see just the opposite uh, relationship that actually as you make the surface dimmer, evaporation goes up. And that's, that's, that's again, uh, surprising. I just want to point out, over land, typically uh, the top of the atmosphere forcing is positive. Over the ocean, it's, it's negative. And we'll come back to that. OK, what I want to do now is I want to talk, uh, I want to uh, sketch out a somewhat mechanistic interpretation of why you might see this relationship between the hydrologic cycle and forcing at the top of the atmosphere, not the surface. And this is based on a uh, paper that came out a few years ago by uh, David Neeland's group. It was by Joe et al., I think, in Journal of Climate 2005. Uh, the idea is you start off with a direct circulation. This is a, essentially a tropical circulation. You have convection. Um, it's a direct circulation, so it has to export energy uh, into the non-convecting or subsiding region. Uh, it does this by having a value of energy, which is denoted by H, the moist, uh, moist static energy, uh, by having the, uh, the export value at the top uh, larger than the import value at the bottom. So anyhow, so this is a fairly standard sketch of a uh, direct circulation. And the idea is uh, to consider a situation where you uh, impose dust radiative forcing in a region where you have uh, convection. And so we impose, uh, with this the bottom panel, we show some forcing uh, at the top uh, of the atmosphere, at the top of the circulation, then we show some forcing at the, at the, uh, at the surface. Okay. Now, the atmosphere is going to adjust, the circulation is going to adjust to this forcing. Uh, and that's going to take on the order of a few months to a year or two to, to really fully come into balance. However, what happens much more quickly is that the surface, uh, through the surface energy balance, adjusts to the surface forcing. So what this means is that over the time scale of the, or over, the, over most of the adjustment of the atmosphere and the circulation to the dust radiative forcing, that, the, uh, that the, the circulation is really only seeing the anomaly at the top of the atmosphere because the surface is, is, is kind of in, is already in equilibrium. It's in, it's in quasi equilibrium. All right, so uh, if we ask how much energy, extra energy, do we have to get rid of as a result of this dust radiative forcing, it really just depends on the forcing at the top of the atmosphere. So I have a little equation about two-thirds of the way down the, uh, 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 down the slide, and it shows that the dust radiative forcing, this extra energy that is imported, or sorry, that's arriving at the top of the, uh, 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 the convecting region, uh, is going to be balanced essentially by either extra, um, extra, extra um, overturning, uh, essentially a stronger overturning circulation, so a larger mass flux out at the top and in at the base, uh, or a change in the, uh, uh, in the contrast between the, uh, the moist static energy, the energy at the top and bottom of the circulation. And just for simplicity, um, th and this is what was assumed by Joe et al., that they, they assumed that that, that contrast of moist static energy uh, was essentially uh, uh, very small compared to the change in the circulation. So the idea is if you have positive top of the atmosphere forcing, you have to have a stronger overturning circulation to, uh, to basically get rid of that energy, to, to come back into balance again. And what this means is you have, uh, you, you have uh, more uh, air converging at the base of the convecting region, bringing moisture with it. And so therefore, the moisture, you have more moisture convergence, um, and therefore, you have more rainfall uh, out, out the bottom of that convecting region. So the idea is that basically, uh, you have top of the atmosphere forcing by dust. Um, it can control the rainfall. Um, somewhat independently of the surface forcing, uh, simply by changing the convergence of rainfall in, in, into the convecting region. Whoops. Sorry, I went too far. Go back. One more. Sorry. Uh, one more after that. Sorry, going forward. Sorry. Okay, one more. Okay, yeah, one more. Okay. Okay, thanks. Okay, so this, uh, I think, is some, in a way, is an explanation for why we see this positive rainfall anomaly over the Sahel uh, in, the, in the summertime in, in, response to the, uh, in, in response to the forcing. And that's because over the continental regions, dust is really a, uh, uh, increases the amount of radiation that's trapped by the planet. It increases the, uh, 
uh, the gain of energy by the atmospheric column. And the column has to adjust to this, and it does this by increasing the rate of overturning and bringing more moisture in at the base. Um, one of the sensitivity experiments we did was we essentially increased the absorption of the particles, and that's shown on the bottom there. Uh, and you can see that as you make the particles even more absorbing, you get a more uh, spatially more ex uh, extensive anomaly and a slightly larger uh, uh, magnitude of the, of the anomaly in, in response to, this, uh, uh, in response to this, this, this greater absorption. Okay, so uh, there are a couple of implications for this. Um, one is that it's really the top of the atmosphere forcing that is controlling the, uh, um, that, that is controlling the rainfall anomaly. Really, really what's happening at the surface is, is comparatively unimportant um, just because the surface forcing is being balanced fairly quickly by, by changes uh, in, in, in the other surface fluxes. You know, the, the long wave flux the, the, uh, uh, and the sensible heat flux, uh, these are especially important over land and to a lesser extent the evaporative flux. But the point is that uh, just the circulation itself is just bringing more moisture into the convecting region and giving you a positive rainfall anomaly to balance the, the positive top of the atmosphere forcing. Um, conversely, if you have reflecting aerosols, say due to sulfates or dust over the ocean where, it's, uh, where the dust is, is fairly uh, reflective compared to the dark ocean underneath, you would have just the opposite situation. There you would have a uh, reduction um, of, of energy, um, sorry, a re reduction of, um, uh, of energy trapped by the column, and you would uh, basically get a, a weaker circulation, and you would have a divergence of, uh, uh, an anomalous divergence of moisture and less rainfall. Um, this is in contrast to the elevated heat pump theory, which really emphasizes the heating. And uh, the elevated heat, heat pump mechanism would actually argue that, um, uh, in fact, the, the uh, uh, reflective aerosols, which have very little absorption associated with them and very little atmospheric heating, would, would have a very small effect on rainfall. And I don't think that's, that's really true. Uh, that's not what we see in the, in the GCM experiments. Um, and I think that's uh, just because what the circulation and what the rainfall is really responding to is not the heating in the column, but actually just the top of the atmosphere forcing by itself. Okay. So I want to um, actually walk through one more argument that really makes the same point. It's a little more kinematic. It's less, it's less physical, but it, it probably um, reduce, uh, uh, addresses some questions you may have. And basically just looks at the, the anomalous surface energy balance. Um, and so the idea is we start up at the top. We have this balance between the various fluxes and, and the surface forcing. So we have, uh, we have a reduction in, in radiation at the surface. Um, we have, we have an anomaly in evaporation, an anomaly in sensible heating, and an anomaly, anomaly in, in radiation. And so just, just um, as, as a way to estimate what's going to happen as a consequence, we could try bulk parameterizations. We could parameterize the long wave and the sensible heat fluxes in terms of the temperature difference between the surface and the air just above the surface. Um, you could do the same thing. Uh, we can actually, we're, I'm just going to set the short wave forcing to zero just, just for, uh, for, for the sake of argument. In evaporation, you could show that actually as a result of the, uh, the bulk formula, you get two terms, one that depends on the temperature difference across the surface, and then one also that depends on the, uh, the temperature of the surface itself. And if you go through and you solve for the, um, um, the evaporative flux in terms of uh, the, the forcing using the, uh, the surface energy balance and also using the fact that the temperature of the surface really is tightly controlled, at least convecting in convecting regions, um, by the top of the atmosphere forcing, you could show that there's a relationship between the evaporative anomaly, the surface forcing, and the uh, top of the atmosphere forcing. And in fact, if you work through the math, you could actually show, show that the, uh, the top of the atmosphere forcing has a bigger effect. So even though the surface forcing is negative, if the uh, top of the atmosphere forcing is large enough, you would actually get more evaporation. And that's basically just happening uh, because of this, this dependence of evaporation, not only on the air sea, uh, or sorry, the, 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 uh, the, the, the temperature difference across the surface, but also the, the absolute value of the temperature at, uh, at the surface. And the way the, uh, the surface energy balance is being satisfied is essentially um, there's less radiation going into the surface, uh, the, uh, the, the sensible heat flux, the long wave flux drop in response, and they drop in such a way to overcompensate the increase in the evaporative flux. All right, so that's essentially answering maybe a nagging question, which is, you know, how is it possible that you could have less radiation going to the surface, but somehow having more evaporation? Oops, sorry. Okay, so the conclusions, um, so, so there are two ideas I guess I'd like to uh, leave you with. One is that the top of the atmosphere, 
radiation, the top of the atmosphere forcing by dust actually is in some ways you know, kind of counterintuitively very important uh, to, the, to the rainfall anomaly. So it's not just a simple matter of looking at the, uh, the reduction of radiation at the surface, looking at the amount of dimming, and then trying to infer an evaporative anomaly due to that. Um, it turns out that the physics of the, uh, of the, the uh, surface fluxes, the anomalous surface fluxes, including evaporation, uh, have a dependence on the top of the atmosphere forcing that's very important. And there are also, um, I've also tried to make a dynamical argument uh, from, based on a paper by Joe et al. in 2005 that, that really makes the same point. Um, and I think what this really argues is that uh, the elevated heat pump theory also is in some ways really too simple a way of looking at it. Um, what the circulation really responds to is not the heating within the column, but really the forcing at the top of the atmosphere. Um, so there are assumptions that really need to, there are some, some of the assumptions here really need to be tested. Um, and uh, for example, uh, there's a whole question about the, um, uh, how, how the, uh, the circulation, how, how the circulation responds to, to forcing in the convecting region. Um, does it respond by changing the rate of overturning or does it, does it respond by changing the, uh, uh, the, the contrast of moist static energy between the entrance and the exit values? And that's something that I think, you know, we have to look at more uh, compli block, sorry, complicated models to, to really resolve. Um, there's another issue too, which is that um, if aerosol forcing is actually driving a stronger circulation and bringing more mass into, into the base of the convecting region, um, What's the consequence, uh, you know, if you have uh, uh, essentially uh, less evaporation on the, uh, underneath the inflow? Um, that's possible. I, I've considered the case where you have forcing over the uh, convecting region, but you can imagine more general situations where a lot of the forcing is actually in the subtropics or in the, uh, in the subsiding region. Um, and it's not really clear which of these two effects is going to win out. The stronger circulation, which might bring more, um, deliver more air, and then the fact that the evaporation is just supplying less moisture to that air in the first place. So I think these, uh, these general mechanistic arguments generally have to be looked at, um, I, I think, you know, um, more broadly, maybe more carefully using, uh, uh, using different models. So I'm going to stop there and, and take questions. Thanks. Questions, please. How do you see that this, um, this radiative effect of dust compares to the effect in magnitude to the effect of dust acting as cloud condensation nuclei and that effect on the cloud dissipation? Actually, I have no way to answer that because I don't have any expertise in, in microphysical effects of, of clouds, as, or sorry, it's basically dust as ice nuclei. Um, my sense of reading the, liter the literature of uh, microphysical effects somewhat anecdotally is that um, they get, uh, you can get a lot of different, different answers depending on um, the dynamics of a particular storm, for example. So I know somebody has, people have looked, for example, at the effect of dust as uh, ice nuclei in hurricanes, and there have been a lot of um, results, I don't want to say they're inconsistent, but it just seems like um, different parameterizations or different observational studies seem to find different effects in different phases of the storm. And so um, maybe this is not really an answer, but I would say I think at least with radiation, you know, the radio effects we actually have, well, I, I don't want to say a clear theory, but we, at least we have some, some general considerations and, and, and we think we see some pretty robust results. So I, I, I really can't answer your question. I'm sorry, so I, uh, sorry, are you asking is the, the forcing due to the dust or what else? Right. Okay, so the, the forcing is basically including not only the, the radiative properties of the particles and their, absor uh, their shortwave absorptivity, but it also includes the uh, the albedo of the underlying surface. And so basically you could have the same particles over, the, over, the, over a, uh, an ocean surface, which is dark, and in that sense the dust will be relatively reflective. Over the land, the dust tends to be darker. Right. Right. 
Okay, so that, that depends on how absorbing you assume that the particles are. And so as, as I make, the, what this argues that, is that for a region like the Sahel, for example, where you see uh, dust in a, in a region that actually is, is relatively rainy during the summer, that if the particles are sufficiently dark and they're increasing the top of the atmosphere forcing enough, uh, that, the, that the dust is going to increase the rainfall in that region. On the other hand, if you assume that the par particles are more reflecting, uh, you may actually see just the opposite, that actually the, the dust is, is actually reducing rainfall in that region just because it changes the export of energy. So it really depends on what you, what you choose for, uh, uh, for the absorption of the particles. I think that's something which actually is not very well constrained right now. So we're, we're doing this more as a sensitivity experiment than anything else. Thank you, Ron. Um, now we would like to introduce uh, Otmar Moller from Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Germany. And the title of his talk is Heterogeneous Ice Nucleation of Uncoated and Coated Desert Dust. Okay, hello everybody. I'm also talking like Paul de Mott on uh, ice nucleation studies and uh, parameterizations of ice nucleation properties, but more from the perspective of uh, laboratory studies. And let me start with this uh, little cartoon which uh, shows the processes we are interested in. So first of all, we would like to quantify this minor fraction of particles like dust particles which act as ice nuclei when incorporated in cloud formation, for instance, uh, supercooled liquid clouds or mixed phase clouds. On the one hand side, and on the other hand side, and I will show at the end of the talk a little bit of that, we are also interested in the effect of uh, surface processing or chemi chemical processes, processes, processing of um, dust particles when they are in, uh, in cloud processes, or, and the effect of that, of the surface modification on ice nucleation properties, for instance, when the same particles are transported high up in the atmosphere and act there as heterogeneous ice nuclei in cirrus cloud formation. So what effect would have surface coating or surface processes on ice nucleation properties. That's the second question. And uh, this uh, shows a little another cartoon or schematic of the ice nucleation processes, um, which is taken from the paper by Corinna Hose and myself. And you see here, so I, in the first part of my talk, I will uh, talk about the immersion freezing processes. So let's think about particles which are incorporated or immersed in supercooled liquid droplets at warm temperatures are cooled further down along this water saturation line, and at some point, at some temperature, they start to act to freeze these, uh, to act as ice nuclei and to freeze these supercooled droplets. And then this, shown here, this is the process of cirrus cloud formation when you come from at lower temperatures, from ice supersaturated conditions, and have expanding air parcels, cooling, and increase in relative humidity. At some point, some particles can act as dep deposition ice nuclei and can contribute to the formation of cirrus clouds at, at lower temperatures. And I'm also talking about simplified parameterizations of those ice nucleation processes. And let me just briefly explain what's behind those uh, simple surface-based parameterizations. So let's start with a simple model of, of, of particles, uh, of just one class of particles of a given monodisperse particles, in that case of a given number concentration and uh, activation energies. And let's just get those incorporated in a cloud droplet, in supercooled cloud droplets, and let that cool at a constant cooling rate. And then classical nucleation theory tells us that the nucleation rate or the freezing probability shown down here, or this is the nucleation rate, is a very steep function of temperature. So when you cool down this system, so you get a very steep onset of ice nucleation. And we can mimic that also and see that in lab studies, like for bacterial cells, so that's just these circles are showing a, an AIDA experiment, sorry for the mouse pointer here, which shows this steep onset of ice formation in a very narrow temperature range. Now Paul de Mott shows us, and we know that from also many lab studies, that natural aerosol systems, complex aerosol systems like uh, mineral dust particles, show freezing over a wide range of temperatures, not just in a such a narrow range of temperature. And that would, need that we, would mean that we need a, a range of, of activation energies of active sites over a wide range of temperatures. And that's just a simple model showing uh, what's behind um, uh, that idea. And that's done in other ways with alpha PDF models or soccer ball models such to distribute over the bunch of particles, um, sub, sub fractions of particles, certain active sites which are, have high freezing um, probabilities at different temperatures. And that's just a simple model with five such sites. 
of uh, different number concentrations. And when you then go through such, a, such an aerosol with five different particles, five different activation energies with the same cooling rate, you see that the different sides freeze at different temperatures. So that with, with time, with cooling, you can then just accumulate the number of ice that forms upon cooling. And you see the individual steps here of, of the individual freezing rates. But then overall, what, what, what our idea is that we just sum up uh, the cumulative curve of ice formation as a function of the cooling rate in such systems. That's shown by this uh, schematic curve here. So we go stepwise through all these uh, nucleation rate uh, parts. But overall, the, the, the freezing behavior, the, for, the formation rate of ice can be approximated by this accumulative, accumulative curve, um, which is uh, temperature dependent and relates the formation rate of ice to the, to the cooling rate, the change of temperature. And these functions here can then now be derived from, for instance, lab studies as a function of surface properties of aerosol particles and size distributions and things like that. That's shown here in this part, which goes through all the equations. So based uh, on, on, on a surface side density model here, so we, we assume that over the aerosol, the number or the size, the, den the, the, the density of such, surface density of such active sites as a function of temperature can be described in that manner, and then you can relate the fraction of particles that fro are frozen after a certain cooling to this surface site density parameter, which is then used also in models to calculate the formation rate of ice as a function of temperature change later on. And we do uh, lab studies to mimic that cooling rate uh, based um, formation of clouds in the, in the AIDA chamber. So we have here just a simple uh, explanation of that. This is uh, plots of pressure and temperature and relative humidities with respect to ice and water. And down here you see individual particles measured upon their size as a function of time with an optical particle count. And this is just starting with aerosols, dust aerosols in that case at uh, constant pressure, constant temperature. And some, at some point we start pumping down the system like simulating an updrafting air parcel. So we have pressure lowering, we have uh, um, then uh, adiabatic cooling, kind of, and then increase of relative humidities. And first of all, we see nothing as soon as we, as long as we are below water saturation here, as soon as we exceed water saturation, we see that cloud droplets start to form on the dust particles in the system. And then later on, when we cool further down these particles, then immersed in the droplets, we see ice formation. That's the immersing freezing process. We can then resolve as a function of the cooling rate or the, the further cooling in the system and relay then the number of ice that forms to the temperature in the system and the surface area of the particles and things like that. That's shown here, so that's just another report presentation of just one experiment, number of ice that forms with cooling, then we just do a fit curve to this number of ice and get these parameters, surface site density, according to this ice nucleation active site concept. This is just showing you how well we can describe the surface area distribution of those particles in the lab so we can relate the number of ice to the surface area and by that we get the surface density of ice active sites as a function of the temperature here. And we did that for a number of experiments with different dust particles from different desert regions and this is just a sum summary plot that was already shown by Paul Lamotte, and you see here the, how this surface site density will uh, varies or changes with, with temperature for the different dust particles, and you see that we can kind of uh, fit most of or all of those desert dust uh, data points with just one curve, and Monica Niemann did that in her PhD work that's published this year in the trust paper. So that that's, that's holds for, for a variety of different dust samples from different desert regions, from, from uh, Asia, from Canary Islands, from the Saharan regions, and things like that. So that's all these colored points. And some particles, like uh, kind of um, artificial uh, samples or crown samples, some, sometimes, sh sometimes show a little bit higher uh, freezing uh, uh, efficiency. And we did some more studies now because we have to assume that this uh, density is um, the same over all the particle sizes. So Naruki here uh, did some uh, measurements as a postdoc in our lab. So you see here some. This is a, a, a busy graph, but you see the same representation of the surface side density as a function of the temperature, now the other way around. And what I want to point out here, we did experiments with uh, some, um, I think it was uh, elite particles at uh, polydisperse and monodisperse sizes. That's the green shaded area, and you see that they scale along the same line. So obviously, in, at, at least in a range of 300 to 500 nanometers, the, the size selected particles in the experiment have the same surface side density as the polydisperse case. So it, it seems to be fairly independent, at least in that size range of the size of the particles, this parameter of, of active side density as a function of the temperature scales well. And uh, to some extent, we are also in agreement with literature studies, but sometimes we see different active site densities, for instance, for kaolinite particles here. 
So, uh, which are in our studies a bit more active than in other studies, for instance, by Welty et al. and Leuren et al. And we cannot reproduce or, or be in agreement with uh, more recent studies of kaolinite, uh, which were published by, by Murray et al. and Pindia et al. And I think that has to do with the way of how, how you measure the surface area in, in the system. So we, we related from size distribution measurements, and here the surface areas were related or derived from um, BET surface area measurements, which is a different uh, measure. Maybe that's part of the story here. And then we, we just applied these parameterizations in a first case study to a dust storm event. So that was a dust outbreak event in uh, 2008, which came from the Saharan regions uh, all the way to Europe uh, over the Kleiner Feldberg area, where we had um, measurements of ice nuclei number concentrations with a fridge technique, and we used the Cosmoart model to calculate based on, uh, on, on, on transport of, of dust from the Sahara, the time series over this event at the Mount Kleiner Feldberg station. So we, 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 we calculated with the, with, the, with the model the uh, time series of dust uh, mass and surface area concentrations, took that as input for, for uh, using parameterizations to calculate or predict the number of ice nuclei and compare that to the measured number of ice nuclei over that time period. And that's shown in that plot. So this is black curve. It's just what's uh, derived from uh, our parameterization for dust particles. I just have shown you so it's just a multiplication of the surface area density with the um, model-derived uh, surface area of the dust particles over that time period. And you can see here that we kind of underpredict the, the measured dust concentrations. But you can say, well, still we are in agreement by a factor of 10, which is maybe not that bad for a first of such a case study. So the measured number concentrations shown here is somewhat higher than the predicted one with our parameterizations. And uh, we applied the same, or we used the same dust amounts for uh, input into other parameterizations, like the one taken from uh, Corina Hose's paper or the Philips et al. parameterizations, and also the one Paul de Mott showed earlier uh, in this session. And you see that at, at lower temperature, at warmer temperatures, we are fairly well in agreement with uh, Paul Lamotte's parameterizations, but at lower temperatures, that deviates. But I think if you would use Paul Lamotte's more recent dust only parameterization, that would fit better together. But we see differences, in particular at warmer temperatures, to these other uh, parameterizations, which can have different reasons. Maybe that uh, these are based on measurements of more active particles like kaolinite or montmorillonite particles, which we also found in some of our studies that they have a somewhat higher ice activity than the natural dust samples. Okay, so um, now a few words uh, on coding effects. So we are now talking about uh, still about immersion freezing. And this is a similar plot now for um, dust cases or aerosol cases which were coded with secondary organic aerosol mass in our AIDA chamber, so at cold conditions. And uh, you see here that uh, we do that just by adding first the dust particles to the chamber, then adding ozone and alpha pinene in, and let then uh, secondary organic aerosol mass form by chemical reactions, which code then the dust particles at the temperature they are investigated for ice nucleation, and you see here in these stars that there's almost no or little effect on the ice nucleation properties in that case for immersion freezing. So that's the immersion freezing case at temperatures around minus 25 to minus 30 C. And uh, that was done for Asian dust and, and Saharan dust here in the blue and, and red um, uh, symbols. And uh, then this is another study which was done in the LATSIS cloud simulation uh, uh, setup or, or, or experiment. This is treatment of Arizona test dust at hot temperatures, at warm temperatures, also as a function of temperature. And if you treat such dust particles with sulfuric acid, with acids at higher temperatures, that has an effect on immersion freezing. Somehow you see here the ice active fractions for the different treatments at different temperatures. So there is an effect, and I think Paul Demott already uh, said that after he was asked for the coding effects. So hot treatments seem to have an effect on immersion freezing as well, which may be due to chemical changes of, of the chemical properties or the surface properties of those particles. And there is also some indication from our own studies that at least around minus 20, that's published in Cicero et al. paper, we also saw a strong suppression of, of freezing, but only at, at that temperature. At lower, tem at lower temperatures, uh, we didn't see that much effect. And also in a recent paper by Pinti et al. also have an indication that hot treatment with acids is changing the immersion freezing properties of su such dust particles. So uh, I think we should need to do more studies on, 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 the, on, on cold uh, uh, sulfuric acid coatings and am ammonium sulfate to see if that would then also have such a strong effect or not. That still needs to be done. 
And then now it's just a few words on the effect of uh, coatings on the position nucleation behavior of dust particles. This is a plot taken from uh, Corinna Hose's paper uh, from this year. And you see here uh, the freezing onsets as uh, in, in, in a measure of, of uh, ice saturation ratio. So then it's water saturation ratios here in this plot. So uh, you see the same particles investigated, untreated and treated, and you see that, that the treatment, different treatments of different particles here, you see the list of publications which is getting in this plot. Most of the coatings in the position nucleation show an effect, the suppression of ice nucleation. So you need higher um, yeah, saturation ratios, higher ice supersaturations to get freezing at the same rate uh, compared to um, uncoated particles. And in many cases, you even have to approach water saturation to, to get um, uh, freezing activated in such coated uh, dust particles. So there is an effect, a clear effect in most of the studies for deposition ice nucleation with coating of different kinds. And uh, more recently, we also did some more measurements. Some of those studies were also done with, for instance, sulfuric acid coatings at hot temperatures at warm temperatures. More recently, in the Aida chamber, we again did some more cold coating with sulfuric acid based on the natural way of how uh, sulfuric acid is formed and, and condensed to particles. So we just started from OH radicals and SO2. So we found a way to also in a dark chamber to generate OH radical concentrations high enough to um, chemically react SO2 and oxidize that to sulfuric acid, which then coated our dust particles at cold temperatures. And again, uh, that was done by uh, Isabel Steinke in her PhD work. It still has to be uh, more further analyzed. But we saw in these experiments also a clear effect of uh, suppression of deposition nucleation in such systems only with very thin coatings. So that's more or less kind of monolayer coatings only, or a few monolayer coatings in these ki kinds. We also sometimes quantified by CC activation of the same particles. So we know that there is coating, and it was little coating only, and it was cold coating, but still there was an effect. Uh, on ice nucleation, uh, uh, on suppression of ice nucleation in the deposition mode. So that, that's also, I think, very relevant to, to atmospheric situations. Okay, that's, with that I'm already uh, to sum, summarize my talk. So I think this ice nucleation active site approach, this cumulative uh, curve approach, is uh, good uh, enough to parameterize immersion freezing of dust aerosol particles. Also in models which have the parameter surface area distribution of dust particles available. So that can be used then to calculate, I think, the formation rate of ice as a function of, of temperature change. And uh, we saw that there's still about a factor of 10 difference or more between measurements of ice nuclei and predicted ice nuclei concentrations, at least in that one case study we did at the Mount Line of Heldberg. And also there are some uh, differences still between the different parameterizations, so there's still some work left to be done in, at that end. I think it's very important to do more f studies um, of that kind so that you have a um, prediction of um, ice nuclei concentrations from based on lab studies and you do good measurements of both aerosol parameters, aerosol properties and ice nuclei concentrations in field studies to have a closure of kind of, uh, of, of, of predicted and, and measured ice, ice nucleation properties of aerosols. And then for, for the coating, we see that there is little effect in, in cases of cold coating with secondary organic aerosol mass. Uh, we have some indication that hot treatment is changing the immersion freezing properties. And in any case, we see some kind of strong suppression or change of ice nucleation properties in the deposition mode ice nucleation uh, um, at, at cold temperatures for cirrus cloud formation. So thank you for your attention. We have time for one question. I have one. <clears throat> does, <clears throat> excuse me, does the hot sulfuric acid change the surface structure of the dust, which is why its ice nucleating properties drop? Yeah, I think it does. Any other questions? Huh? 
I think there is some indication that, that, that some uh, uh, bacterial cells or biomaterials are related to dust. I think that can also assume that that's the case, uh, in particular if the dust is coming from vegeta more vegetated areas still, for instance. So I think there are, there are lots of evidence that that, uh, that can happen, but I think up to now we do not really well know how many of the particles would uh, carry such bacterial cells, and I would not be able to tell. There are some studies, of course, which indicate that, that, that uh, that's the case, but if it's the dust or the bacterial cell which makes the eyes, or how many of the biomaterials or, or, or particles are there to, to, to induce freezing at warmer temperatures, in, yeah, which are co-transported sort of with the dust particles, I think we are far from knowing that quantitatively. You could think that that's the case, but I think it's really hard to to tell and to quantify that right now. Thank you very much, Otmar. And uh, now we will have the last talk of this session. But before having that, we would like to call your attention to our poster session that will be today in the afternoon. Is this session A twenty three F, and starts at one forty p.m. And the last talk is by Cindy Tui from Oregon State University, and the title of the talk is Interactions Between Saharan Dust and Tropical Convection. Good morning. First of all, did anybody lose some glasses? I found some on the floor over there. Glasses? Prescri prescription? Yeah, okay. Well, they'll be up here. Uh, well, I'd like to talk about um, interactions uh, between Saharan dust and tropical convection, some modeling studies and measurements that we've been doing in this area. And the image shows an example of the uh, Saharan air layer. There we go. <laughs> um, that typically is off the coast of Africa in the summer months. And you can see that there's um, convective storms that typically form in the same region. So there's definitely opportunities for interaction between these uh, different atmospheric phenomena. So some background is that we know that vast quantities of soil dust particles are generated over the Sahara and carried west with the dry Saharan air layer. Um, over the Atlantic, um, the sol can interact with tropical cyclones. And this has likely consequences because we know that soil dust is mostly insoluble and it's an efficient ice nucleus. And also, it's possible that it can be a cloud condensation nucleus, or CCN, and we'll talk a bit about that later. The observations, um, limited observations, suggest that the interaction of sol with Atlantic storms may initially invigorate them, but over time, seem, um, it seems to actually inhibit the development of um, storms into more organized cyclones and even into hurricanes. And what are some of the possible mechanisms for this? Well, one is that dust within the sol may influence storm microphysics and thermodynamics directly through its action as an IN or a CCN in individual particles. Um, also, the sol is basically a dry, high wind shear air mass, and so this has potential to weaken storms directly. And I should say from our field measurements that we found Saharan dust in Anvil Cirrus near Africa in the NAMA project. We actually sampled uh, anvil ice outflow from storms with a counterflow virtual impactor, and we found that about 30 to 70 percent of the non-volatile residual particles within anvil cirrus were actually Saharan dust. And you can see here on the plot, these are the different samples versus the percent of residuals containing dust. And what we found is that for um, particles in two different size ranges, large and small particles, um, in both these ranges, we found dust. And in fact, we found dust particles down to a tenth of a micron in size present in cloud ice. So that seems like a lot of dust, but actually, if you take the size distribution and you integrate it to estimate how much mass that is, it turns out it's only typically 0.04 to 0.4 micrograms per cubic meter of dust present in the ice. And this is actually a really small percent of dust compared to dust present in the sol, which is typically hundreds of micrograms per cubic meter. And I should say um, also that we have a project PREDICT where we sampled storm outflow over the Caribbean, and we found that um, those ice crystals also contain dust, although not as often in, as the ones downwind of Africa. So we know it acts as, uh, as an IN. We know it gets into the ice. We also know that it acts as a CCN in the region. Um, in NAMA, we were fortunate to uh, sample a cloud that was actually embedded within the sol layer. And we evaporated uh, the individual cloud droplets. 
And what we found is that from this pie chart, about 79% of the residual nuclei from the cloud droplets were basically unprocessed dust or dust that didn't have any obvious um, coatings with sulfate or sea salt. And we thought that was kind of strange at first, but then we realized that most of these particles were aluminum silicate clay particles, and these contain components that can absorb or adsorb water, and there's been a number of studies that looked at that uh, recently. And it actually turns out that a 0.6 micron Saharan dust particle has similar CCN activation characteristics to a 0.1 micron completely soluble salt particle. So if dust acts as CCN, what are the potential impacts on deep convection? And this is basically work by others that I'm just summarizing here. But basically, if you have enhanced CCN uh, going into a cloud, you get more smaller droplets. And this actually means in deep convection that you get less warm rain. And so more water reaches up to higher regions in the cloud where it can freeze and grow. And as it, um, that freezing and growth process releases additional latent heat, and this can actually lead to stronger updrafts, deeper clouds, and more precipitation, which can then produce, in some cases, produce cold pools, which can lead to secondary convection and even more precipitation. So it seems that uh, CCN ten tends to enhance uh, the development of small storms, but then when you go to large tropical cyclones, things get a little more complicated. Rosenfeld, Cotton, Jang, others have done some studies that show that in tropical cyclones, you can get convection enhancement by CCN in the outer regions of the storm that actually can inhibit the development of the storm center. So that may be why, kind of over time, um, the SOL may be um, slowing down the development of some of these tri tropical cyclones. So to summarize to this point, based on measurements, we know Saharan dust particles act as CCN over the Atlantic. Prior studies have shown that these increased CCN can enhance deep convection. We know based on lab and field data that you've seen today that it's an efficient immersion freezing nucleus, and it's also found in the anvil region of tropical storms. So we wanted to investigate this further with the, uh, a model to look at these questions such as what are the dual effects of dust as both CCN and ion on storm development, and um, which, which role dominates, if any. We wanted to know what's the impact of the dry layer that the dust is contained within on convection development. We wanted to know what's the fate of the dust, how much of it is actually processed through clouds, how much of it's removed to the ocean surface where it may be important for ocean biogeochemistry, and how much of it is resuspended at higher levels, perhaps to go on and influence clouds uh, further down the road. So to do this, we used the RAMS model um, at CSU, uh, idealized simulations initially. Um, I don't have time to go into all the details here. The white are basically things that we've presented before. Um, and so I'm just going to point out the, the yellow cases here are things that we've improved recently in the model. And the first is that we've now got heterogeneous ice nucleation parameterized with the DeMott scheme that you, you heard about. Uh, later, so I don't have to go into it. Basically, nucleation is a function of temperature and particle concentration. And then we've also got the latest data in there, so it's specific to dust species um, uh, using the most, the most recent data, as I said. And then we've also modified the model so we can actually look at where dust mass goes in the storm, and we can actually resuspend dust upon evaporation and, and sublimation back into the atmosphere. So this is the aerosol profile we used. I uh, apologize, that's a little hard to see, but it's based on realistic data from actually within the SOL layer, and we had uh, basically concentration here versus height, and there's a CCN mode of completely soluble aerosol, and then there's two dust modes, small and large dust modes, uh, which tend to peak here just above the boundary layer. We have four aerosol treatments. The first is background, where we only have 1% of dust um, in the SOL layer, and then we have three different uh, microphysical treatments, one where we allow dust to act as ice nuclei only, one where it can act as CCN only, and then one where we double it up with both um, possibilities. So an individual particle can act as a CCN, be immersed in a cloud droplet, and then go on that same particle to freeze ice within the model. And then we've got three humidity pro profiles based on a, a high cape sounding 
um, that was actually measured during NIAMA, and then we've modified that slightly. So the first is actually the moist sounding is measured, and then we've reduced the relative humidity by 20% and 40% at the dust levels to more accurately simulate what's really going on in terms of humidity in the saw layer. And this makes 12 cases. I'm not going to show you all these, so I'm focusing on the ones in yellow. Dust is IN, dust is CCM plus IN, the moist sounding, and then the sounding which is drier at the dust levels. So this is the first results from the model. This is a four-hour time series of uh, what's going on with, in the updraft regions in terms of the vertical velocities. And so we've got time for the four hours versus the average vertical velocity. And the four cases are the blue is CCM plus IN, the red is IN only, the solid lines are high relative humidity cases, and the dotted lines are low relative humidity cases. So the main points here is that dust is CCN plus IN, the blue cases, are more vigorous than their corresponding dust is uh, IN only cases, and this is probably due to additional latent heat release um, due to water being lofted to higher levels. And then the low humidity cases have, you can see, have the dotted lines have weaker updrafts, but the dust is CCN, um, which is the dotted blue line here, even with the low relative humidity, is still pretty vigorous despite that dry air influence. So you can see it reaches pretty high updrafts here. The low relative humidity IN only case doesn't really do much at all. And this also affects ice water path. And uh, so similar plot for ice water path in the updraft region. And what you find here is that the CCM plus IN cases have higher ice water paths um, than their corresponding IN only case at both humidity levels. And switching gears here to actually be looking at um, contour plots of the updraft region. This is after two and a half hours into the simulation. Here we've got basically distance versus altitude in meters. And on the left, the IN only case. On the right, the CCN plus IN case. And the contours are total condensate, so liquid plus uh, ice mass. And what you see basically is that the dust at CCN creates a more extensive, stronger updraft and more condensate overall. Um, I should notice we've also got updraft velocity in black and unscavenged dust in blue. So basically these dotted lines are the amount of uh, remnants of dust in the layer. It hasn't been scavenged at this point. Now if we go to cloud ice concentration, number concentration um, for the cases, we also see pretty big differences. So for the IN only case, these hot colors represent high ice uh, concentrations of around uh, 10 or more, 10 to 20 per cubic centimeter, whereas for the, low, for the CCN case, we find much lower ice concentrations. So um, we, we find, for the CCN case, we find less small ice, we actually found more large ice and more ice mass overall. Now, when you look at dust mass within the ice and within hydrometeors, this is where things get really interesting. So now we've got dust in condensate plotted. And what we find here is that for the IN only case, we get a lot of dust. These hot colors here are way up in the upper levels of the updraft, whereas in the CCN case, it's the opposite. Most of the dust is actually at low levels. And what's happening is because it's hygroscopic, it's actually removed ultimately in rain uh, much of it to the surface. And this is important because if you look at the column mass uh, removed to the ocean surface of dust, here now we're looking at um, basically the whole domain, 200 by 200 kilometers domain, looking down at it. And for the IN only case, you can see something like 5% of the dust mass, of the column dust mass is actually removed to the surface. Whereas if you look at the CCM plus IN case, you can see very high amounts of dust removal, um, particularly in the main, uh, almost 100% in the main updraft region here. So what about cloud ice at 4.5 hours? Now this is late in the lifetime of the storm when we probably were um, more likely to be sampling um, in our field experiment. So now we're going to try to look at this in comparison to some observations. So for the IN only case here in the anvil, at four and a half hours we see concentrate, dust concentrations typical of two to five per cubic centimeter, whereas in the dust, the CCM plus IN case, it's more down by a factor of four or so, 0.5 to two per cubic centimeter. And we can compare that to a nice overview study um, done by Lawson where they looked at a um, number of anvils during anvil 
or <laughs> during NAMA, and came up with uh, sort of typical average uh, ice anvil concentrations using the 2DS probe, and it was only about 0.6 per cubic centimeter. So for this um, kind of preliminary comparison, it looks like the dust is CCM plus ion cases agreeing better with observations than um, when you allow dust to act as ion only. And then we've also um, done another uh, calculation where we've compared to a different uh, measurement. Here we've got dust max mass actually contained within ice in the anvil. And here we see huge differences between the two cases, ion only versus CCM plus ion. For, in the simulations, with dust as ion, we see about 100 to 200 micrograms dust per gram of ice. So we've divided by the ice water content here. Whereas in the CCM plus ion, it's down by orders of magnitude, only about 0.1 to 0.1 micrograms dust per gram of ice. And if we look at the measurements from the CVI data where we've integrated the dust over the size distribution divided by the ice water content, we find we get less than one microgram dust per gram of ice typical. So again, this independent measurement seems to agree better um, when we allow dust is to act as CCN than when we assume it's, it's just an IN in the model. So to conclude, allowing dust to be CCN is important. Storms with dust as CCN are predicted to have stronger updrafts and more condensate than when dust is IN only. Um, just briefly touched on the dryness of the layer, but it, it does seem to reduce convective intensity, but dust acting as CCN plus IN still leads to pretty strong updrafts. And then in the dust is CCN and IN case, much of the dust mass is actually removed through nucleation and precipitation scavenging in the storm core. And this basically leads to lower ice up crystal number in the anvil as, um, as we see in the field data. And field measurements of dust mass in the outflow show dust is the dominant aerosol in anvil ice, but at relatively low concentrations. And this is also in general agreement with the dust as CCN plus IN case. So um, I'm done. In the future, we'd like to do similar simulations um, with case studies of full tropical cyclones. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cindy. Uh, we have time for questions. What do you mean overseeding? Um, you know, we haven't actually looked at that. I think satellite data would be the way to, to look at that. I think some others have, but um, no, we haven't. I'm sorry. I, I have a question. Um, so the sow is often elevated. Do you allow CCN to come in through entrainment and not just through cloud-based activation? Yes. So it's, if you look, uh, remember the plot that I showed you, it was basically um, CCN, it does can act as CCN at the levels at which the sol typically is, and, and, and they do. <laughs> it's brought in from all levels, yeah. Any other questions? Huh? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much to all the speakers and uh, for for accepting being here, submitting your presentations, or accepting our invitations to be here. Let's uh, give all of them an applause and. Uh, also, we would like to thank um, Andy, um, Andy Hinesfield from NCAR, who was one of the conveners. Paola Formenti couldn't make it. She was the other one. And uh, let's uh, go to the coffee break. Don't forget the poster session this afternoon at 1.40. <laughs>